I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I tried to warn you as much as possible. It was meant to be a happily ever after, but it turned out to be anything but a fairy tale. Two years after the nation celebrated, it could not have been a happier, more glorious day. But then things started to go downhill. How has it all gone so wrong? We had this unpredictable couple who were going to do things in a very different way. When did the cracks start to show? The so-called Fab Four dream disintegrated step by step. Where did the problems really lie? If you compare the newspaper uh, coverage of Meghan to any of Harry's past girlfriends, it's quite shocking. They don't seem to be in touch with the mood of the nation anymore. And was it ever really going to work? It's not enough to just survive something, right? Like, that's not the point of life. You've got to thrive. As they try to start a new life in L.A., they're going to war with an old enemy. Last night came the surprise announcement that she is suing the Mail on Sunday. It would be much better if Meghan and Harry simply said nothing. Were the signs of trouble there from the very start? And what does the future hold for Harry and Meghan? How celebrity are they going to become? How diluted will the royal brand become? Harry is stepping away from the life that he was born into. It has been two turbulent and very troubled years. They're like a drowning couple. The more they struggle to escape the things that they don't like, the more they sing. Harry and Meghan have changed the regal backdrop of Windsor for the luxurious Hollywood Hills. We won't be hearing about Harry, Meghan and Archie and the royal family together as one for, I expect, for months to come until they come and visit over here or maybe, maybe William and Kate and George and Charlotte and Louis will head on over to L.A. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great photo op? They've also swapped the royal court for the high court in a legal battle which highlights so much of what's gone wrong in the past two years. Meghan's family issues, their fight for privacy, their war with the tabloid press. The court case could turn into their biggest nightmare. And it all centers on letters written. Only two years ago, Harry and Meghan's wedding had been a day when Britain basked in the sunshine and the warm glow of a royal couple, all set to transform the future of the monarchy. The mix of the tradition and the new and the mix of cultures totally embodied in one church service. And billions of people watched that service and were moved to tears, both by the romance of it and by what it represented. We celebrated with them, but were the seeds of their already clear to those who looked. For the two years since the wedding, I think they've tried to recreate and, and maintain the kind of positivity that was around at the time, but that's just unrealistic and naive. Less than 10 years ago, Harry watched older brother William marry his queen. The future heir to the throne had officially settled but the younger prince didn't look likely to follow suit anytime soon. This was quite a difficult period in Harry's public image because whilst people loved the sort of cheeky chappy image, once he was constantly being photographed falling out of Sloney nightclubs on the King's Road, people did start to slightly turn against him. Pressure on the prince's love life had also been building after two long-term relationships came and went. The first love, Chelsea Davey, who he fell head over heels in love with, she had to look into the goldfish bowl of royalty and to realise absolutely this wasn't the life for her. Harry was disappointed. His second relationship with Cressida Bonus, an actor, and she, too, didn't like the idea of media intrusion. When you marry into the royal family, you have to give up so much individually. 
as a person, or at least that's what's expected of you. Girlfriend wise, you know, it's just my private life, so it's, it's a different story. But yes, I am very, very, very protective. Obviously, it is, it is part of my life. It's something that is part of the baggage that comes with me. I wouldn't say that Harry was unlucky in love. He just hadn't found the right one until Meghan came along. And when American actress Meghan Markle did come along, she looked set to change everything. When Meghan first appeared with Harry, she seemed absolutely perfect. The fact that she was American, she was a career woman, she was mixed race, she brought a whole lot of new things into the royal family that the royal family needed. In this strong, striking, confident woman and the scrutiny of being in the public eye. But the nation's favorite prince, with a divorced Hollywood A-lister, raised some eyebrows from the start. Much attention was paid to her mixed heritage. Harry's fallen in love, and there were people happy about that. But then on the other side, there were people, the papers, the mainstream papers and the tabloids, talking about her in a very negative sense. People were already painting her in ways that it was clear they knew nothing about her, but it suited their negative narrative to call her what she's not, without any evidence. It is, and it was, racist. If you compare the newspaper coverage of Meghan compared to any of, really, Harry's past girlfriends, you know, it, it's quite shocking. The press has always denied racism. In November 2016, Prince Harry confirmed his relationship with Meghan in a statement telling the tabloids to back off. Looking back, was this an early sign that it wouldn't be business as usual? Harry issued this quite extraordinary statement attacking um, some sections of the media. He wasn't going to tolerate the kind of invasive techniques that once surrounded his late mother. He couldn't protect his mother because he was only a small boy, but boy, was he going to protect Meghan. In the explosive statement released via his press secretary, Harry also asked the media to pause and reflect before any further damage is done. This statement packed a punch. It was Harry speaking in a way that he had never done before when he was talking about um, levels of harassment, unacceptable levels of harassment, how Meghan had been the victim of sexist, racist comments and commentary and negative articles. He was clearly a very, very angry man. And actually, to a degree, he had a right to be. Prince Harry has always had a level of mistrust towards the media. But this was one fight that was always going to have an unhappy ending. The palace thought it was unnecessarily antagonistic uh, and as though Harry was somehow spoiling for a fight. He went about it in an aggressively confrontational kind of way. You cannot control the media. The Queen has managed to reach a position where she's very rarely criticised because when she in the past has occasionally been criticised, she says nothing. It would be much better if Meghan and Harry simply said nothing. A year after Harry's unprecedented statement, news broke that he and Meghan were engaged. The nation's favourite younger brother decided to give us all some good news today by announcing he was to marry the likeable Meghan Markle. Unlike Harry's from Kensington Palace, I was, of course, anticipating it, me being an American, uh, who, who obviously I've married into aristocracy, and then to see somebody else, just to see how she would be on camera, and it was wonderful. What were we doing? Just roasting chicken? Roasting chicken. Trying to roast chicken. <laughs> Trying to roast the chicken, and it was just, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. You could see she was just smiling the whole time and, and almost laughing several times throughout the interview. But even at what should have been one of the happiest moments of his life, Harry still showed some signs of anxiety about how his fiance would be treated. I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we knew no, that I, it would be. You know, I tried to, I tried, I tried to warn, I tried to warn you as much as possible. Both of us were in, totally surprised by the, the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves of what actually happened from then. So I think you can, you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible, but we were, we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that. The scrutiny? Well, all sorts. <laughs> you could see that the old thorny issue of Harry's relationship
with the press, was raising its head again. The news that the world's most popular prince was set to marry a Hollywood actress sent the world into a frenzy. Their wedding was an unforgettable day, but could this story ever really have a fairy tale ending? Things were said and done in the run-up to the wedding that both sides regret that had caused irreparable damage. On the 19th of May, 2018, the eyes of the world were on St George's Chapel in Windsor. The wedding day was wonderful. Meghan looked beautiful in her dress. Harry couldn't have looked happier. The ceremony itself was so vibrant, it was so new, it was so different, it was so unique to the two of them. And I think it was the start of something very, very happy and very, very special. Nobody can deny that the wedding day itself was sparkling, it was magic. It was like Disneyland. The couple were given the titles Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Everything seemed perfect, but was there trouble and unrest just hidden from view? Everybody was happy for Harry. Everybody thought Meghan was marvellous. It could not have been a happier, more glorious day. But then we all started to come off amid suggestions that the couple had been a bit difficult over the planning of the wedding and that demands were being made that perhaps weren't quite in proportion with their place in the royal pecking order. He said before the wedding, what Meghan wants, Meghan gets. Negative reports surrounding claims of Meghan's behaviour emerged from within the palace. It's been reported that Meghan was demanding that she wanted uh, a certain tiara to wear and then she was given the one that she didn't want to wear. And claims Meghan rowed with Kate's staff, which were denied by Kensington Palace. Meghan just didn't like any pressure and on a couple of occasions, she actually told staff not to interfere. It was none of their business. She would have the wedding she wanted. No one had any idea that this was all building up into a much bigger and wider, more troubling picture. According to reports at the time, it was claimed Meghan also clashed with members of Harry's own family. Speculation was rife. There was a huge row when Kate was upset because Meghan insisted she didn't like the dress that Princess Charlotte was planning to wear as one of the bridesmaids. And inevitably, if you shout at someone in private and you're a royal, there is a good chance it will be leaked. There was a constant feed of endless negativity. Author Tom Quinn believes Harry and Meghan's private accommodation played a part in the tensions. Nottingham Cottage is in the grounds of uh, Kensington Palace, and it's quite small. I mean, it's tiny compared to the enormous double apartment that Kate and William had. It was being pointed out to them in no uncertain terms. They weren't in the first division because that place is held by William and Kate. So in inevitably that led to friction. In Meghan's world, if you're determined enough, you can get to the top, but Meghan can't. She can't get to the top, whatever she does. Was the untraditional mix of American celebrity and British royalty ever really going to work? The wedding was also marred by controversies surrounding Meghan's father. We're talking a global wedding for millions to see across the world. People are anticipating this and what's being reported day after day to the lead up of the wedding is about her father, Thomas Markle. And is he going to come over and walk her down the aisle? Are they speaking? Have they spoken? There was the whole farcical business of Thomas saying, I can't come to the wedding, but then photographs suddenly appeared taken by a paparazzi showing Thomas Markle being measured for a suit, looking at a book about English landmarks. And these pictures were sold all over the world to the huge impact. Thomas Markle couldn't walk Meghan down the aisle, but he did carry out a string of interviews with the British press. It meant he continued to dominate headlines even after the wedding. I'm a footnote in one of the greatest moments in history rather than the dad walking her down the aisle. Millions watched this interview on ITV's Good Morning Britain as he explained 
why he staged paparazzi photos. They take all kinds of pictures of me that making me look negative. So I thought this would be a nice way of improving my look. Well, obviously that all went to hell. Uh, and uh, I feel bad about it. I apologize for it. There seems to have been this this toing and froing of mutual accusations where Meghan felt her father wasn't being sufficiently positive about the wedding. And Thomas Markle felt that there was no sympathy for him. Thomas Markle also discussed conversations he claimed to have had with Harry in private. I was complaining I didn't like Donald Trump. He said, give Donald Trump a, a, a chance. What were Prince Harry's views on Brexit? It was just a loose conversation about something that we have to, we have to try. Uh, I think he was open to the experiment. But text messages presented as evidence in Meghan's upcoming court hearing have revealed what conversations really took place. We now know what Harry was really thinking as newly revealed texts from him just before the wedding warned Meghan's father about talking to the media. These text messages are actually evidence showing that they were reaching out to Thomas Markle, that they didn't uh, close him off at, by any stretch of the imagination, that they were trying to contact him and, and speak to him. The private messages also showed how Meghan made attempts to speak with her father. Not sure the royal family uh, as a whole will be affected in any way by the, 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 the publication of these texts, but they won't like the fact that Meghan and Harry have shown once again that they're not very good at dealing with the media. Evidence given to the High Court also confirmed that Thomas Markle hasn't been in contact with Meghan. Two years on, the extraordinary messages have lifted a lid on private royal conversations that are now being showcased to the public. Right now, Meghan and Harry are thinking, we're just going to release everything to prove to everybody uh, um, what exactly and really did happen. I think that now that they have moved thousands of miles away from home, that they're not supported by that palace PR machine, they're more vulnerable, they are more at risk, and they're more exposed now than ever. Debate over Meghan's relationship with her father was another problem in a growing list of troubles that followed the wedding. Could the most troubling issue of all be Harry's fallout with his own brother? One of the things that unquestionably adversely affected the relations between Harry and William, who were so close for so many years, was a series of rumours after the wedding. William expressed doubts to Harry whether or not he was too quick in being engaged to Meghan. There was a brotherly discussion, which I think was voiced out of concern from William, but was misinterpreted as a lack of support. Things were said and done in the run-up to the wedding that both sides regret, but had caused irreparable damage. That's Harry. He's quite a headstrong, impulsive young man. He's much more like his late mother than William, who considers things and is in, in that regard is more of a Windsor and more like his father. The alleged drift between Harry and William cast doubt over the future of the Fab Four. The title given to the brothers and their partners after they joined forces for the Royal Foundation charity. They looked amazing, they were all similar ages, and they all had, it looked like, a common purpose to make the royal family younger, more modern, more diverse, uh, more approachable, more empathetic. All of those things worked very, very well for a brief period, and then the cracks started to show. Had signs of trouble even been evident at their first public event as a quartet? Okay, the last thing you disagreed on, how do you resolve it? Uh, I can't remember, they come so thick and <laughs> <laughs> but, but is it resolved? We don't know. Oh, oh, we don't know. 
or you're putting on a great show if it's not. The so-called Fab Four dream disintegrated step by step. Despite the troubles within their family, it wasn't long before news broke that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex was starting their own. The real crunch came when, when Archie was due to be born. Even before the birth, Meghan's celebrity lifestyle... Now, nothing wrong with going to a baby shower. That's what Americans do. We don't do it so often in, in the UK, but they do it in America. It's a, it's a common practice. But she flew over a private jet. What's wrong with a commercial jet? It was the first sign of breaking with royal tradition, and there would be more to come. They wanted to do things very differently. All right, so far, but things then got a bit laughable. All the little signals meant a breakup with the royal family was inevitable. And now suddenly we had this unpredictable couple who were going to do things in a very different way. For decades, new additions to the royal family have been welcomed to the world on the famous steps of the Lindo Wing of St Mary's Hospital in central London. But not when it came to Harry and Meghan's first child, Archie. I'm very excited to announce that Meghan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. The first public glimpse of the royal baby came two days after he was born. I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Uh, he gets that from <laughs> <laughs> They were not going to follow the usual pattern of a royal birth. Uh, they wouldn't say, A, where the baby was going to be born or when it was born. They would make the announcements on their terms at a time that suited them. But at the same time, they were members of the royal family and, and they had accepted £2.4 million to renovate their house in Windsor. I think the public felt that they had a right to get excited about the birth, to maybe wait outside the hospital, wait for a glimpse of mother and baby and father to come out. But then the public was denied that. That really rattled the press. They didn't like it. As well as denying the papers a front-page picture, Harry and Meghan also kept their choice of godparents private. Looking back, a telling sign that big changes were on the horizon. I think that this was their way of saying, oh my gosh, the more we give to the press, the more they take and write not very kind articles about people or about our lives. So they just thought, we're gonna start we're going to start stepping back so that they have nothing to, to write anything damaging about. But it was very much Harry and Meghan not just wanting to do their own thing, but wanting to say, we're signalling a change. Things are not going to be the same anymore. We're an independent unit. The couple had already begun forging their own path, moving from Kensington Palace to Windsor in time for Archie's birth. Then, a month later, they split from William and Kate's royal foundation, marking the end of the Fab Four. Their appearance 18 months earlier at a royal foundation forum proved to be the first and last time the quartet would appear at such an event together. Do you ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Can you really have four very big personalities with different backgrounds, with Meghan and Kate, and futures with William and Harry, can they really be a cohesive group that can work very happily together? They probably should have separated at the very beginning and not tried to be a quartet. As a new family, Harry, Meghan and Archie toured Southern Africa. I wanted to ensure that our first visit as a family, with my wife by my side, focused on the significant challenges facing millions of South Africans. Many of their troubles seemed to disappear. They got very positive press in Southern Africa. That went down incredibly well. They couldn't have done it had they written the script themselves. Couldn't have been better. They were the golden couple sprinkling fairy dust all over Southern Africa. And then at the end of that tour, they completely shot themselves in the foot. This led to the ITV documentary where they talked about so being so deeply unhappy 
as senior members of the royal family, which hit the world like something of a thunderbolt. In a revealing documentary, Harry and Meghan express their true feelings and the problems bubbling under the surface. There's been a lot of talk in the press about rifts with your brother. How much of that is true? Look, we're, we're brothers. We're, we'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment, but I will always be there for him, and as I know, he'll always be there for me. I don't know what the impact on your physical and mental health of all the pressure that you clearly feel under. Thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm OK. It's not enough to just survive something, right? Like, that's not the point of life. You've got to thrive. You've got to feel happy. And I think I really tried to adopt this British sensibility of a stiff upper lip. <laughs> she did really try to adapt this British stiff upper lip, keep calm and carry on, you know, never complain, never explain. But let's remember, she's American. We, we like to complain and, and explain. Rather ill-advised, in my view, because, you know, he talked about how you know, grim their lives were. Um, against a backdrop of, of one of the most benighted and poorest parts on the globe. This wasn't enough. They also wanted to send a message to the tabloids. While Harry and Meghan were 5,000 miles from home last night, came the surprise announcement that she is suing the Mail on Sunday for publishing a private letter she wrote to her estranged father. Harry's bombshell statement at the end of that tour announcing that his wife was taking legal action against a newspaper um, and really well, a character assassination, I suppose, on, on the British media. No one expected it to end like that. Harry and Meghan were very publicly sharing their troubles with the world, and the world lapped them up. I, I think that part of the fascination and the outrage um, thrown at Harry and Meghan is it, probably deeply rooted in jealousy in some part, right? People don't want to accept that. Be it ordinary people like you and I, or you know, high-profile people who just want to get in there. People think that Harry and Meghan is the next, I don't know, chapter or episode of Netflix's The Crown. No, these are real people. At Christmas, Harry and Meghan did things their own way again. They spent Christmas in Canada, not Sandringham. The only other time Harry had missed Christmas with the Queen was when he served in Afghanistan. And just two years earlier, the royal family had broken protocol to invite Meghan to the celebrations. Meghan was invited to Sandringham for royal Christmas before they were even married. She is the only royal girlfriend to have been afforded that privilege. So I think the royals went above and beyond and did everything they possibly could to make her feel at home. But their decision to skip Sandringham 2019 was a clear sign of an imminent and much bigger decision. Once Harry and Meghan had gone to Canada for Christmas, once it became clear that they'd taken their dogs with them, it became very, very obvious that they weren't coming back anytime soon. Just before Christmas, he and Meghan decided to have a pause and, and think about what they wanted to do. They went off to Canada, and when they came back, it was announced early in 2020 that they were going to remove themselves from royal life. In January 2020, they dropped the biggest bombshell of all. They said they intended to step back as senior royals. It was absolutely shattering. I think he gave other senior royals, including the Queen, almost no notice at all. And I thought that he and Meghan had gone rogue, that this was a deplorable way to handle it. I think that the Queen should have been informed. There had been negotiations that had been going on for some time, but nothing had been decided. And he was told to commit his ideas to paper, and he responded, well, no, if I do that, it'll just end up in the newspapers. Essentially, on one hand, you had a royal family feeling that they were being bounced into making a decision on the couple's future, and the couple being very frustrated that the palace machinery wasn't quick enough to respond to their desire to change things. For many, what became known as Megxit now seems like it had been inevitable from the start. Harry and Meghan sort of perceived slights at every twist and turn, and um, uh, things which seemed quite minor became quite major, and uh, it really came as, as no surprise as, as the weeks and months went by that really what they were angling for was not just... This could lead to 
the ultimate horror that Meghan could appear in court, at least in theory, against her father, Thomas. They don't seem to be in touch with, with the mood of the nation anymore. In the two troubled years since their wedding, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have made no secret of their feelings towards the tabloids. Looking back, Harry has long been vocal about what he sees as press intrusion. They still upset me and I still read them. Why, I do not know. And so what, what do you think the public perception of, of Harry is? Um, I don't know, it fluctuates, it depends on what the media want to write, I suppose. That feeling only grew when he and Meghan became a couple. Anything, positive or negative, it just didn't make sense. Being part of this family in this role, in this job, every single time I see a camera, every single time I hear a click, every single time I see a flash, it takes me straight back. In a bid to distance themselves from the glare of the spotlight, Harry and Meghan went to Canada. I think the reason for this whole upheaval, I suspect, was that Meghan was unhappy here and Harry wanted to protect her and to make her happy. And I think she was unhappy probably because she had made some very big life changes in a very short space of time. She'd left her job, she'd left her country and all her support network in America. She had come to a new country, she'd married into a big family and she'd taken on a new job and she had had a baby. All of these things are huge events and they'd happened in under two years. People had been putting the dots together and working out that actually they hadn't just gone for a long Christmas break. They really had escaped as far as they saw it and had no intention of coming back. There was shock in the wider British public. I think there was dismay and great sadness that it seemed so drastic. Any plans for an easy transition across the Atlantic soon hit controversy. Canada said it would not fit their security bill following their change in royal status. Security has always been so important for Harry, and he stressed this throughout the negotiations, but this will be extremely costly. It's like a sort of daydream. It's like a dream of an ideal world where they can have a private life and they'll be able to do whatever they want. There wasn't an easy way for them to half in and half out royals. Just days before their royal status was officially due to end, Harry and Meghan's plans, as US borders threatened to close amidst the coronavirus breakout, Harry, Meghan and Archie made a dash for California. Harry, I think, decided, probably quite impulsively, which is in his nature, to get Meghan back to her comfort zone. Their original plans have sort of fallen in tatters. They've got to decide what it is to do, how they want to do it, when they want to do it, and where they want to do it. They've got advisors around them, and I hope they're getting the right advice, uh, because the right advice is not just about what is good for Canada and the United States, it's also what is not going to bounce back on the monarchy and on the institution. It's important that they take that in consideration as well. As Harry and Meghan attempted to settle peacefully into LA life, their battle with the British press continued. Their long-awaited court case finally Meghan is suing Associated Newspapers for misuse of private information, breach of data protection and copyright infringement. After a letter she sent her father was published by the Mail on Sunday. This is a private letter to her father expressing, you know, her feelings and having that released absolutely will cause uh, distress on anybody. But to do so, she and Harry have had to reveal more personal information in court. They don't like being uh, written about in the British tabloid press, but at the same time, they are suing, and that will come out in the courts, all of the text messages and the documents. So they must feel very, very confident that what they have to show will, in one sense, vindicate them, absolutely. They want to use this opportunity to change the narrative about Meghan being this distant daughter who doesn't care about her father. 
clearly it means a lot to her personally to be able to say none of these things are, tr are true i got in touch with my father i tried to help my father it was difficult to reach my father he wasn't responsive the reality is that they have to do this and whether they win the court case or not they are the first to do it and i think that means a lot the first round went in favor of the mail on sunday with the judge dismissing some of megan's claims against the publisher including allegations that it acted dishonestly the judge threw out in the preliminary hearing threw out some of the allegations that uh, megan and harry had made against the mail he described them as irrelevant just not part of anything the law could look at or decide on. But that was just the opening battle. When the case goes to trial, it could all get really uncomfortable. If you want less press intrusion, yet you launch court cases against the press, this could lead to the ultimate horror, and that would be that Meghan could appear in court, at least in theory, against her father, Thomas, who has contributed to a great deal of the adverse publicity that they've received. That would be a global news story and be truly bizarre. On top of Meghan's legal action, Harry has also filed a lawsuit against The Sun and The Daily Mirror for alleged phone hacking. I think Harry doesn't really like the press and I think he often puts on a smile and a brave face but deep down there's a, a loathing there. He's obviously trying to be specific with the Mail on Sunday's publication of Meghan's letter and indeed he's being specific on hacking. If legal proceedings weren't enough, the pair have written an open letter to the Daily Mail, the Sun, the Daily Mirror and the Daily Express, signalling their interest to expect no corroboration and zero engagement. Immediately it was picked up by the tabloids and made into a story itself and it, it made Meghan and Harry also it made them seem petulant they'll dig around even more furiously now for the sort of information that Meghan and Harry, Harry don't want to come out so it will have the opposite effect from the one intended the choices he's going to have to make moving forward but that absence of palace protection which he did find frustrating there is a sense that even before Meghan was on the scene he was growing sick and tired of being told what he couldn't do by the palace. I'm not quite sure what it is that they want. You're taking on a big beast if you go to war with the tabloids. They are very powerful and they have the ability to make or break. The months to come are going to be crucial for Harry and Meghan as they start a life away from the royal family and attempt to leave their troubles in the past. I think they are tremendously happy together but there's no question that this is at a very high price. Harry and Meghan's life as a married couple at the forefront of royal duties in Britain lasted just two years. The couple's new life is here, Los Angeles. But it hasn't taken long for reports to emerge claiming Harry feels his world has been turned upside down and that he misses the military. When he did leave, he clearly wasn't ready or willing or able to completely sever those ties, which is why he's continued not just with some uh, honorary titles and um, you know, sort of bells and whistles jobs, but he wanted to really continue to support particularly injured servicemen, both with the walking charity and with the Invictus Games. And that has obviously brought him a lot of happiness. I think that's the thing he's going to miss the most now that he's not in the UK. He'd be like a lost soul there. It'd be far worse for Harry in America than it was for Meghan in England, because he's not as tough as she is. It seems for Meghan, there's no place like home. If you look at the photos when we were first kind of introduced to Meghan, she was in yoga leggings, she was in her Ugg boots, she was casual, and then all of a sudden she moves over here and she's in, you know, stockings, or as I would say, pantyhose, wearing a dress, having to wear a hat, full hair and makeup, heels all of the time, and all of a sudden they've gone back to North America and she's back in her yoga pants and, you know, her comfy boots and casual and going back to how Probably she has been living her whole life apart from this little blip when she was living here for, you know, what, less than two years. How are you making it no different from some of us that pack up our bags and go live in Australia or New Zealand or move to South Africa or decide whether or not you're getting what you want from the place? And maybe they plan to be there for a short while, for a long while. I don't know. And can I be honest? It's not my business. 
While the couple have been stateside, there have clearly been some things they've missed back in the UK. Reports claim Harry is back in touch with William and the whole family video called the Queen. They did the Zoom call, uh, you know, on the Queen's 94th birthday with Archie and, you know, that was, you know, accurately reported. You know, this is her grandson. This is her great grandson. So the Queen's always going to have a connection with Harry and vice versa. Even that was reported in two ways. Some viewed it as a cynical PR move. Others said Harry and Meghan can't win. They were simply showing they've not forgotten their family. I think Harry loves his grandmother, the Queen, and he won't want to do anything to embarrass her. I think that will be in his mind first and foremost, along with protecting Meghan and Archie. Harry and Meghan may have very little control over what is written about them. But with a new bombshell biography on the horizon, is this a sign that they are trying more than ever to be authors of their own future? A tell-all book would really quite shock everybody. I don't think that they're really even worried about the damage to their reputation. This summer, Harry and Meghan will continue to dominate headlines. A new unauthorized biography will soon be hitting shelves, with claims it will be very much told from the couple's perspective. It promises unique access to friends of Harry and Meghan and will dispel many rumors and misconceptions that plague the couple. Will it be a case of history repeating itself? Look at what happened to his mother when she did the biography with Andrew Morton. You know, it caused massive um, issues and, and problems within the royal family. I don't think he wants to follow in those footsteps of his mother right now in what she did in opening up to the world a tell-all book. Again, it would really go against everything that they're trying to, uh, to put out there is that we want to be private. It's probably, again, their own pathway of saying, you know what, we want to tell our story and this is the way we're going to tell our story. Reports claim Meghan wants the book released sooner rather than later and that she wants to shatter the image of being a demanding diva. You can be certain that the book won't give both sides of the story. I think it's more likely to be a self-justifying book, but it does give them something to do in a world... The story is far from over, along with all its troubles. They may have left palaces and protocols behind, but Los Angeles comes with its own way of doing things. In the world of celebrity, anything goes. I mean, you can go to a burger joint and be photographed outside haven't got the same kind of privacy restrictions but also the same agreement between newspapers and the palace they're not protected by the palace anymore how celebrity are they going to become how diluted will the royal brand become you know, harry is stepping away from the life that he was born into that that comes with risks for him harry and Meghan say they're determined to carry on charitable work marking archie's first birthday the couple featured their son in an online charity video only to receive yet more we're going to read Duck, Rabbit, Eddie. Oh, no. <sighs> Good job. I think it's very odd and typical of the slightly contradictory nature of their lives and their views because making a video of Archie on his first birthday, it's very sweet, and we know it's linked to um, a children's charity that Meghan supports, um, which is all good. But at the same time, it does show that Meghan probably more than Harry is not going to be able to say goodbye to the media and to having a media presence. She can't do it. They could release photos of Archie whenever they want to. I don't think they're really having their cake and eating it too. I think that they feel like, well, we can now do what we want to do. For Meghan, life has gone full circle and she's back in Hollywood. But where does that leave Harry? I think they'll take a lot of advice from the Obamas. Of, you know, they've set up their production companies that they'll talking to Oprah Winfrey, they'll be talking to big figures like that to try to find a way to carve a role for themselves as philanthropists, entrepreneurs, you know, huge figures on a, on a global platform. How they earn their money without people think they're trading in on their royal status is the tricky bit. However they choose to earn a living will be a new venture for former senior royals. If it doesn't work 
Is there a path back to the palace? I think, in a way, it's seeing how they behave. If they use the royal family to make pots of money, um, that then it won't be very good. If there's a tell-all interview on the television by Meghan and or Harry, you know, that's not going to go down well. So they're really under the watchful eye of the royal family for the first year, which they probably don't like at all. The door has been quite clearly left open by the Queen for them to return to the royal family if that was what they wanted to do. She has allowed them to keep Frogmore Cottage, although they've been asked to pay back the £2.4 million pounds that the taxpayers paid for the refurbishment, and rightly so, able to use the HRH status. But I don't think they will come back. I think this is the life that Harry actually has always wanted. Meghan has been the catalyst. She has enabled him to do this. She's helped to give him the confidence to take a step outside of the role that he was born into and to embark on a new chapter. They may be at the start of a new chapter, but it's been a troubled two years for Harry and Meghan. Looking back, were there signs of trouble from the start? And looking to the future, are there signs of more trouble yet to come? Harry was intent on a different path, clearly. I mean, I don't think he, he deliberately set out to upset the public, and quite probably he hasn't. Although I do think a lot of people have become rather disenchanted with him, and her over what has happened subsequently, and he is not quite the popular figure that he once was. No matter what, someone is gonna be criticizing them no matter what they do. They have this wonderful platform and they know it. I don't think they're getting very good advice at the moment, and I don't think they are thinking a lot of these things through. Harry and Meghan are no different from any other couple out there. This is one of the fights that they have to undertake together. And it all centers on letters written. Only two years ago, Harry and Meghan's wedding had been a day when Britain basked in the sunshine and the warm glow of a royal couple, all set to transform the future of the monarchy. The mix of the tradition and the new and the mix of cultures totally embodied in one church service. And billions of people watched that service and were moved to tears both by the romance of it and by what it represented. We celebrated with them, but were the seeds of their troubles already clear to those who looked? For the two years since the wedding, I think they've tried to recreate and, and maintain the kind of positivity that was around at the time, but that's just unrealistic and 